I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to Conversations in the Digital Age. Our show is about Japan. What's new and where are we headed in the land of the rising sun? And with us is a real expert. She is Sheila Smith. Sheila Smith is a senior fellow for Asian studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. And she is an author of a forthcoming book entitled Intimate Rivals, Japan's Domestic Politics and a Rising China. Sheila, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Jim. It's great to be back. Now, Sheila, uh, your book uh, has China in its title. And everywhere you turn in any discussion of Japanese politics, China emerges. Why is China so important? Well, because China's rising. I mean, that's the, that's the way we talk about China these days. Is but Japan that, is supposed to be rising, too. Well, Japan has risen, and I think the, 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 the tension between the two countries is really about that. Japan is a status quo power. It's a major power in Asia and has been for the last three or four decades. China now is challenging Japan's status as the major power of Asia, and it's challenging not only Japan but others around the region who are sort of trying to figure out whether this China is going to be good for their country or whether this China is really going to challenge some of the basic interests that, that many of the powers around Asia have had. Now, you pick up a newspaper and there's an article about Japan and it mentions for sure the 600 days of Prime Minister Abe. Now, tell us something about Abe. What is he up to? Well, Prime Minister Abe is about to arrive in New York. Uh, he'll be here for the UN General Assembly, but he's had a fairly spectacular success in terms of leading Japan. He arrived in power again for the second time in December 2012. He really reoriented the country towards stimulating economic growth, towards believing that their country can get back on its feet and become competitive again. Abenomics. Abenomics, right? So the three arrows, as he describes it, are... Well, tell us about the three arrows. Why three arrows? Well, the first arrow was fiscal, and it was a stimulus to the economy. The second arrow was monetary policy, which, as you know, the Bank of Japan has been very hesitant to use the monetary instrument uh, aggressively. And so the new Bank of Japan governor, Mr. Kuroda, has turned the tables on that and said, I will use my instruments as I see fit, and I want a, a target of inflation of 2%. As you know, Japan's gone through a couple of decades of deflationary uh, economics, right? So the use of that monetary instrument was new for the Bank of Japan. But the real challenge for Mr. Abe is the third arrow, which is structural. Uh, change. And from Mr. Koizumi back in 2001. Koizumi was his predecessor. Right, way back, a decade or, uh, or so ago. The, ask, this question of how much structural Japan, how much structural change Japan can implement is really the key to figuring out whether that economy is going to be viable in the future. But the latest uh, report is that uh, economic recovery has been slowed. Uh, Abe raised the sales tax from 5% to 8%. Mm -hmm. uh, people said they didn't feel that, but in October they're supposed to raise it another 2%. That's right. And of course it's claimed that by analysts that that would be regressive and uh, that's what's caused the downturn. That's right. And again, I'm not an economist, so I won't speculate about next year's Japanese economic performance, but that's true. Before the LDP, the Liberal Democrats, came back into power in, in 2012, there was an agreement, a cross-government agreement with that party as well as the former party in power that the consumption tax really needed to happen in Japan, that Japan needed the revenue going forward. It has 240% of its GDP tied up in debt. Um, and so they needed to do something. And that law that passed before he came back in, but his, his party supported, was this two-tiered approach to raising consumption tax. He's put in charge of the party. The secretary general of his party today is the man who negotiated that deal, a cross-party uh, deal in the, in the Japanese parliament. So I don't think that he's going to back off from this consumption tax issue. Now, he is the leader of the Liberal Democratic Party. That's right. But it's not so liberal and it's not so democratic. Isn't it really <laughs> a, a right-leaning kind of uh, political philosophy? It is Japan's conservative party. Uh, so if you wanted to equ equate it to the Tories in England, that's I mean, Great Britain, that's who the, 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 it would be, the conservatives in Australia, for example. But so, not to the Tea Party. Not to the Tea Party. No, it's slightly different than our Tea Party. And largely, Japan's political system, again, is a parliamentary system. There is no presidential system, so he doesn't have the full authority that American, an American president would have. He has to carry the parliament in order to implement his policies. Uh, his party is conservative. It's fiscally conservative. It's socially conservative. And on issues of diplomacy and history, it is also a conservative party. And he has uh, a, fair, a fair tailwind behind his diplomacy which is really to restore Japan's power, 
and perhaps even to build its military power so that Japan is not feeling vulnerable in Northeast Asia today. Well, let's first talk about uh, diplomacy. In, uh, in 600 days, he's visited at least 49 countries. Yes, uh, his mentor, uh, Koizumi, it took him 1,980 days to visit 49 <laughs> countries. Uh, he's been traveling up a storm. What is he up to? He has. He's been peripatetic. He's been everywhere. And I think, you know, we don't actually see it that much unless you're following his travel schedule. But he's been up to building new relationships as well as trying to revitalize some old relationships. He's been to Europe. He's been to South Asia. He's been working on the relationship with Russia, which up until the, you know, the, the annexation of the Crimea was a good diplomatic, diplomatic activity for him. He's obviously been to the United States. He came here in February of, of 2013 to make sure that the United States understood that he put the alliance first in his diplomacy. But he has been on the road, and part of it has been energy diplomacy. He's been going to the Middle East. He's been going to other countries to talk about uh, Japan's energy needs. He's even been talking about sales of nuclear uh, plants and other kinds of commercial nuclear uh, agreements with other countries. He's been, he just had uh, Prime Minister Modi in Tokyo, which was a real success. The India-Japan partnership is something he, he puts a lot of stake in. So he's been trying to revitalize a, a host of relationships, first Southeast Asia, but then broadly around the globe. The two relationships he's had the most difficulty with, however, have been China and South Korea. And he hasn't visited either. He hasn't visited in either. And in, in fact, both of the leaders of those two countries refused to see him. Uh, but uh, he sent an emissary, didn't he, uh, for a secret meeting, uh, Mr. Fukuda? He has. He sent a number of people from the associated with Mr. Abe have gone, have gone to, to Beijing. So the first visit was actually way back in the spring of 2013. He sent Mr. Natsuo Yamaguchi, who is the head of his coalition partner, the Komeito, and he has a very close relationship with the Communist Party, and that was a very successful visit. After that, he, he attempted to send another senior member of his own party, but Xi Jinping was not going to see that person, so that didn't happen. Very recently, the same person, Mr. Komura, who is the, Komura, yes. Yes, he's the, he's the deputy head of the party, he had a very successful visit, and then followed by Mr. Fukuda Yasuo, has, as you know, as a former uh, prime minister and with very good ties to China as well. So it looks like uh, at the APEC meeting in November, which is coming up, it's hosted by China. It looks like Abe and Xi will finally meet. Uh, and when will that be? In November, uh, in the second or third week of, of November. Of 2014. Of this year, so in, in a couple of months. The UN you know, General Assembly is another place to keep an eye out for any kinds of meetings that could happen at the foreign ministerial level. Uh, but I don't know that there's anything announced at this particular moment. Now, we talked about the three arrows. Uh, is the any plan to increase the, the military budget? Well, the military budget has gone up, but 0.8%. So it's not you know, a momentous change, but it went up last year. Uh, it is, it, the MOD has asked for a considerable increase, which in Japanese terms means something like 1.8 to 2%, depending on how you count the budget. They are not likely to get that much of a leap. Uh, but I suspect that we are on a, a trend now of 1% growth, perhaps, per annum going forward. Um, for over a decade, and especially when the Democratic Party of Japan, uh, his, his predecessors, right, when they were in power, the de defense budget actually was a negative growth. So does that mean that uh, Japan is becoming more militaristic? Well, now it means it can afford the programs it's already planned for. And so there is a, the Japanese are participating in the, the development of the F-35 next generation fighter. They have invested in more uh, destroyers, some of them are helicopter capable. They have put out a plan that will enhance their submarine fleet. They have very good conventional submarines, and now they're going to have more of them in the waters around the East China Sea and beyond. And they're going to build a new amphibious landing force. Their ground self-defense forces, their army, is looking to our Marine Corps, in fact, as a model for amphibious uh, operations. And they're also selling armaments to India, aren't they, well, and that, uh, yes. other countries? Yes. Now, that's the one piece of the Abe agenda that I think really is important that people aren't paying attention to. Um, they're lo they have relaxed the, what used to be the three principles of non-export of weapons, right? Now, they're calling it the three principles of defense technology transfer. <laughs> so they slightly different twist. And does this and have roots in the Japanese Constitution, Article 9, that uh, no. armaments are only supposed to be used for defensive purposes? Well, it does have roots in the debate over that in the 1960s. So the parliamentary debate in the 60s over how to interpret the Constitution 
exactly produce those three principles of non-export of weapons. So that was one way Japan was going to say, we are not going to be a military power. But Mr. Abe has understood, I think, that in order for Japan to be in the mix, so to speak, in terms of new technologies and new relationships, uh, he, his, his technological ad advantages in terms of weaponry are going to be an important instrument. Australia is interested in th those conventional submarines. Indians, as well as other Southeast Asian nations, are interested in Coast Guard vessels, uh, especially seaplanes for the Indians. Even the, Brit the Brits are interested in some of Japan's new technologies. So uh, how fast and how furious Japan is going to actually begin these joint development or sales projects, I can't say at the moment. It's still quite complicated at home, but he's at least signaled that he's now willing to consider on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, helping his neighbors and others who are partners of Japan around the globe develop their, their defense capabilities. Now, all this goes back to uh, World War II in many ways. I mean, the uh, uh, grandfather of Mr. Abe was Mr. Kishi, mm -hmm. who was in the cabinet mm -hmm. uh, during World War II. Uh, and became the prime minister. Uh, and there was a prime minister right after World War II who believed that uh, Japan's security had to rely on its relationship with the United States. That's right. Now that seems yeah. to be changing, doesn't it? And now they seem to be ignoring the United States and uh, uh, as they uh, tilt toward other countries. Well, I think that might be one step too far in interpreting what Mr. Abe's intent is. I think the, the United States and Japan have a very interdependent military alliance. They don't have a joint command structure like NATO or like the U.S. and the, the Koreans. They haven't really, over the last half century, had to think about contingency planning or war planning, largely because Japan wasn't on the front line of any potential use of force. It was kind of a supporting actor. It provided bases to the U.S. military. It allowed the U.S. forces to operate off of Japan. It supported, in di diplomatic terms, the use of those forces. But it never really felt uh, that it would be a direct focus of military action. And that's changed. And that's changed largely because of the island dispute with China and because the Chinese deployment of Coast Guard vessels around those islands and really a challenge to Japan's control over those islands. So the alliance today is different than it was in the past, but it is no less important to Japan. So instead of uh, conducting joint military options with the United States, or maybe in addition to, uh, they're uh, conducting joint military operations with other countries. Well, I and don't. That's new, isn't it? It is, and I think. But to take a step back, this year what the, Mr. Abe introduced was the the debate in Japan over whether or not they should reinterpret the constitution to allow for what they call the collective, the right of collective self-defense. So reinterpret defense to mean offense. Well, to allow the military to, to work with us to work alongside U.S. forces, to do use force if need be to help the United States defend Japan. So it's a very narrow interpretation. It's not an offensive mission. Otherwise, in terms of their relationship with other militaries around the region, it's U under the U.N. auspices, peacekeeping, for example, any kind of collective action that would be sanctioned by the U.N. Security Council. So it's still, despite all the talk about constitutional reinterpretation, if you look at the missions, it's still a very narrow interpretation of what Japan's post-war military can do. Uh, well, of course, uh, this military ramp-up mm -hmm. is a source of concern in light of yeah. Abe's possible revisionism. He did uh, several times he visited the shrine at Yazu uh, Kuni, the final resting place of yeah. uh, a number of people uh, convicted of war crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and he went once as prime minister, and uh, no one knows whether he's going to go again. Uh, and then there's the, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that and the issue of the comfort women as well. Well, he has problems, I think, in particular with South Korea at the moment. And we all focus on China. My book focuses on China. But, but I think for policymakers in Washington, one of the most difficult uh, relationships right now is the Japan-Korea relationship. Park Geun-hye, the new president of, of South Korea, when she came into office shortly, uh, around the same time as Mr. Abe, right, um, basically said you can have no regional co cooperation in Northeast Asia without a correct understanding of history. So she put forward in her diplomatic agenda in Northeast Asia this question of historical legacies and the correct interpretation of what happened in the past. Colonial history, the colonial history between Japan and South Korea, as you know, is very, has always been a major part of that relationship. But it rises and falls, this issue of history, and uh, depending on leaders, depending on the timing, um, and depending on the domestic politics in both countries. Mr. Abe, 
uh, has had some difficulty, I think, with this notion of the Japanese uh, comfort women. Uh, he's had difficulty with the Kono statement, which was done in 1993, in terms of an apology to uh, the South Koreans and other women uh, around the globe that the Japanese military had used to, in brothels, right? had forcibly used in brothels. And he has he's hesitated to really acknowledge that this was done forcibly by the Japanese Imperial Army. Or to apologize for it. Or to apologize further. So the Kono Statement, when he came into office, there was, there was a lot of indication that he may not endorse the Kono Statement, in fact, that he may want a new statement, an Abe Statement, that really moved back from where the previous governments had been on this issue. He did ultimately endorse it this spring, but only after his own visit to Yaskuni last December, uh, occasioned considerable protest, including a statement by the U.S. government that they were disappointed. Uh, in his choice. Uh, to well, he go doesn't to have China. an altogether bad uh, record on women, does he? Because he appointed five to his cabinet in the recent reshuffle. He did, and he has a new program called Womenomics. It's really designed to enhance the participation of Japanese women in the economy, in large part part of his growth strategy, right? But I, I, I think you have to also understand that um, the Japanese government on international initiatives has long supported human security initiatives, has long supported issues uh, around the globe in terms of empowering women, but also assisting women in conflict and post-conflict scenarios. So Japan's ODA, its Overseas Development Assistance, has increasingly been focused on the plight of women and children, uh, refugees and other communities. However, the five women in his cabinet are also conservative women. Right? So this is not an endorsement of the fact that this is a new liberal approach to gender in Japan. It is a, an approach that the conservative party themselves recognize that they need to ad address large part because uh, he said it himself at a conference in Tokyo uh, last week. He said, we are known as a traditional society. We need to change. And I think the Japanese society understands that it's going to need its women, not just economically, but socially and politically going forward. Now, uh, Sheila, you mentioned the dispute over the islands with China and uh, the Senkaku yes. uh, Islands. And uh, London economists said that they're just a pile of rocks. I mean, what is this big flap about? Well, economists don't think we should fight over anything. <laughs> That's why they're, luckily, they're part well, of I mean, our policy these are mix. writers for the, for the London... Uh, oh, for the Economist magazine. Yeah, That's yeah, true. Yes, yeah. they are. They have the great title on The Economist, right, with the little turtle going, could they actually go to war? And the little yeah. turtle says, yes, they could. And I, I fully agree with that. Um, they could because the sovereignty distinctions, delineations in Asia, not just between Japan and China, but between Japan, uh, China and other countries in, South, in the South China Sea, right? These are also the, 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 the bedrock of both the changing geostrategy in the region, right? China is moving outwards in terms of developing its military capability. It has a policy of declaring or gaining back, as it puts it, uh, the solid territories that were taken away from it in the past. So it has its own... Including mandate, Okinawa. Including Okinawa by, by the People's Daily, by some fringe members mm -hmm. of the Communist Party. But, um, but to be... But to be the other side of it, is, of course, is that the UN law of the sea, which is the maritime regime in, in around the globe, right? That relies on landforms, right? So if you want to decide where your exclusive economic zone is, where your maritime uh, economic boundaries are, which is beyond your coastal waters, right? Then rocks matter. Rocks, islets, and islands all matter. So there's an economic dimension to this, a resource dimension in terms of fisheries, which as you know, throughout Asia, there's been lots of fisheries competition, but also seabed uh, oil and gas resources as well. So this is not just a strategic context you know, in which we have to think about territory and sovereignty, although that matters. It's also an economic contest. So upon these rocks, I will build my country. Exactly. Uh, now, th uh, <laughs> the governor of Tokyo recently raised the Japanese flag on Okinotori Island. Was that provocative? Okino. Okino that, uh, did that provoke China? No, here's the thing. Okinotori Shima, so that uh, your listeners know, so the, the, the Senkaku Diaoyu dispute is in the East China Sea, yeah. so it's in the waters between Japan and China. Okinotori Shima is uh -huh. over here in the Western Pacific. And it kind of, you know, it's, it's a submerged reef at the moment because of changes, climate change, and what's happening to the, to the oceans. And so the Japanese built it up with some concrete and put a fence on it and sends research vessels out there. People go out and scuba dive out there, but it's a submerged reef. J China and Taiwan, which often have the same claims, right, over these islands, they have not contested Japan's right to it. Um, 
But it is an important piece of this puzzle about how the UN law of the sea is going to determine what are legitimate exclusive economic zones. So if Japan, and it does, claim Okino Torishima, then it has a, a, a right to extend its EEZ for, for much further south, right, than it might otherwise do. It also has the right to send submarines and it has the right to patrol that water in a way that um, would be the same as coastal waters, right? So it has meaning for that strategic balance in the region. And China and Taiwan are not contesting Japan's right to it. The, they question whether or not that's really the basis of an island, that that should be the basis of Japan's EEZ claims. Uh, now, Obama uh, said that he was going to pivot toward Asia. Mm -hmm. And the time that he made that uh, statement, he was subject to much criticism because it was thought that he was going to turn his back on the Middle East. I mean, pivot mm -hmm. kind of implies you give up one interest for another. Mm -hmm. uh, is the pivot anything more than rhetoric? And, uh, and, and now that the Middle East is heating up again, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what are we doing in Asia? Well, I think the first Obama administration, um, there was some quarrel over whether pivot was the right word or rebalance was the right word um, I, for precisely the criticism that you mentioned. I think the Obama administration moved to rebalance to talk about we're not turning our back anywhere, but we are focusing on where our long-term interests reside, and that is in the dynamic economies and the relationships and partnerships and allies we have in Asia. I think it was the right move. I think it continues to be the right policy. Um, it is understaffed and underfunded at the moment, and I think in the first Obama administration, the president had a, a very articulate uh, advocate of that strategy, which was Secretary Clinton. Uh, and, and Secretary Gates was uh, also very uh, supportive of that, although he was very focused, as you know from his book, on the Middle East and what was going on in, in the wars that were still ongoing. So Secretary Clinton could really lead the charge there, and she did it in a way that I think was very important. We have long-standing alliances in Northeast Asia with Japan and the Republic of Korea. So this rising China and, and all the situation we've talked about in the East China Sea was really managed in large part through these alliances and through our direct dialogue with China. But Southeast Asia had, had, had not been the focal point of American attention. And what Secretary Clinton and her assistant secretary at the time, Kirk Campbell, did was that they really invigorated the Southeast Asian part of our diplomacy. She went to the East Asia Summit, she went to the ASEAN Regional Forum, excuse me, and the president went to the East Asia Summit, which is a new summit meeting. Of ASEAN leaders. is Southeast Asia. Yes, uh, the Indonesia. Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And it's been, a, it's been the kind of bedrock or the foundation of efforts since the 1980s to expand uh, multilateralism through the Asia Pacific. So ASEAN is kind of the foundation, and then the larger powers have con you know, basically coalesced around it. So the United States became a player uh, in that multilateral diplomacy and, and also opened the opening to Myanmar. Our ASEAN partners, Southeast Asian partners, had been advocating for a long time that we really needed to urge Myanmar and the leadership of Myanmar to become much more focused on both other activities in Southeast Asia, but on the relationship with us. So uh, just to sum up, uh, what's your forecast for Japan? We see they have economic problems, uh, Abenomics, Three Arrows, isn't mm. really doesn't seem to be working at the moment. Increasingly militaristic, increasingly nationalistic <laughs> tensions with China in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. Uh, where are we headed? Well, I don't think we're, I, I, that, that, that's a pretty negative picture. So let me ro roll you back a little bit on that negative picture. They have a leader now that has 60 to 70 percent support rating and sustainable support rating. So I think the first piece of the puzzle is that they have a, a, a government that's been stable for more than a year. And I think they've had trouble with that. So I think in Washington in particular, having a consistent partner at the head of government is, is a positive. I think the Japanese people are increasingly optimistic about their, about their government's ability to really tackle some of Japan's problems. We mentioned fiscal, we mentioned the economy, social structural changes that are really necessary, including the issue of womenomics, but beyond that as well, energy and the, the quality of life in Japan. Um, education is another point. So he has a huge domestic agenda. But I think people are more confident that he can handle, that their government now can handle the geostrategic shifts that are underway. The U.S.-Japan relationship is going to be difficult. I think post-war Asia has been remarkably calm. Uh, it is not calm anymore, and I think as we focus on the Middle East, we should not be taking our eye off of the many potential flashpoints that could emerge. Okay, we have to stop, but let's not take our eye off Japan or the <laughs> Pacific region. That's Sheila right. Smith has been just wonderful, and thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for, for having coming me. by. My pleasure. And thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in.
next week for more conversations in the digital age. For conversations in the digital age, I am Jim Zirin. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you.